Hmm. So what do we have here? This is the RCA Studio 2, one of the earliest game consoles that could take interchangeable cartridges. Widely panned as one of the worst game consoles, if not the worst game console of all time. I think that's a bit of an unfortunate description because if it had come out just a little bit sooner, it would have been considered groundbreaking. It just was a little bit late to market. Or perhaps if when it came out, if it actually had some of the features that I know the folks at RCA had on the workbench, what eventually would have become, I guess, the Studio 3. Anyway, it's a fascinating console. Unfortunately, like many consoles of its era, it has a RF television output. One of these switches will switch between channel 2 and channel 3, which, of course, no idea what's going on on the display there. Anyway... Uh, so I had to figure out another way to get power into it. It's pretty tricky because the video output and the power coming in, 9 volt DC, actually share the same cable. So you're used to nowadays this RCA connector being a composite video output, but this is actually RF. You can flip these switches and choose between channel 2 and channel 3, and that comes from a time when televisions didn't have all these crazy inputs on the back. You just had an antenna input. Needless to say, that makes it a bit tricky to interface with modern televisions, and it's also just really mediocre quality. And consider you have composite video output coming from the chip here that can then gets modulated up to RF, and then it has to be demodulated, and you lose things in the process. Anyway. You've got this single line that also, in addition to having that composite signal, it has the composite video going out, but it also has the 9 volt DC input coming in, which is a little nuts. So this would hook to, in practice, this would hook to a switch box that would have some, I don't know, probably some capacitors and maybe transformers, something or the other to make sure that these things remain separate. Because I know the television would not want 9 volt DC going in into the antenna input. Anyway, so I had to rig up my own power source. So here I've just got a standard 2.1 millimeter jack that we can use a standard wall wart. This is a 5 volt DC wall wart. I was tempted to use something like a micro USB or mini USB. I've got a million of those mini USB cables lying around, but I thought using something like a barrel jack would feel a little more authentic to the era. What is this guy here? This guy here is an emitter follower, so I guess that would be a common collector amplifier. So this is drawing from this little connection here. This is actually, I think it's uh, 1861 is the actual title that most people know this by. It's got this weird TA-1017. Anyway, this is what the designers called the, the Pixie graphics chip, and it produces this beautiful... <laughs> 32 by 64, 32 pixels high, 64 wide, black and white display. Um, again, over underwhelming even when it came out, but still fun. Anyway, you'll notice that I did a little terrible job here uh, connecting to uh, these two resistors. One of, them, one of them connects to a sync output on the chip, and the other connects to a intensity output. And these resistors basically sum those together to give you this composite out. So that comes out to this little buffer here. Let's see. And uh, this, of course, also needs ground and power. So I found there was a 5 volt sitting right here on that resistor that I thought would be easy to latch on to. Uh, and then I took a wire, kind of looped it under here to try to provide some sort of support, and then did this terrible bodge job. Soldering to this giant ground plane was a big pain because these things act as a big heat sink. This is not a very, this is kind of an embarrassing solder joint. Not quite as embarrassing as this solder joint. <laughs> wow, that's terrible. That's the ground. Again, I looped the wire under the PCB there. Probably a terrible idea. Anyway, that's, that's for the main power. And then this 5 volt I tied over to, wow, that's ugly. Anyway, I found there was 5 volt sitting here. So there's no actual 9 volt coming in. I think there's 9 volt used, I'm guessing, I haven't looked under in here, underneath the shield here. 
So I don't know if it really needs 9 volt for the RF module here to work, the RF modulator to work, but I'm bypassing it anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Here's the voltage regulator classic 7805 that would take the 9 volt coming in and regulate down to 5 volts. That's dropping four volts across the regulator. So of course you need a nice heat sink. Notice it's sort of connected to this giant ground plane here as a heat sink. Let's see what else we have here. So as I mentioned, one of these switches, switches the ARF modulator between channel two and channel three. The other turns on and off the sound effect, which is not very exciting. If I hit the reset button here, Okay, so let's listen to the amazing sound effects. I'm going to hit the four button here after resetting. So that picked that car game. Let's see, what else do I have here? Let me reset again. Let me press five. Uh, some numbers come up. I hit five again, and the sound effect is actually created by this 555 timer here, which is just basically set to a fixed frequency. And there's a capacitor in there. I think I think it does some changing because you can also get this kind of sound in addition to burp. Anyway, it's not very exciting. This is gated, if I remember correctly, by the Q output line from the main processor here, which is this fascinating chip. This is the CDP-1802. There are versions of this that are radiation hardened. They're silicon on sapphire chips, from what I understand. And so they're in things like... Uh, Galileo probe, and I think it's also in the Hubble Space Telescope and other crazy places. A fascinating chip. It was part of a hobbyist computer called the ELF that the 1802 designer Joseph Weisbacher created. And they also, RCA also made a VIP, the Cosmac VIP and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, there's people who are definitely out there fans of this chip. It's a very interesting chip. It's quite different than the other 70s, 80s chips like the 6502 and Z80 that you're probably more accustomed to. So we've got four chips here that are 1822 chips. These, from what I understand, are four-bit words, 256 words on each chip. So two chips will give you 256 bytes. So all four gives you a whopping 512 bytes. And I think half of that is actually taken up by the graphics display buffer. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, we have some ROMs over here. Let's see, what are these? They say 1831. And so unlike something like the Atari 2600, this does have some quote-unquote operating system type stuff built into ROM, including an interpreter. So most of these games, these classic games, are actually programmed in something called Chip 8. I guess you could think of it as like the old P code from things like Apple Pascal and what did they call that? The P machine, something like that. And I don't know, Java byte codes or .NET or something like that. Anyway, it's a virtual machine that's running a language that's kind of higher level than machine language, but not as high level probably as something like basic. Let's see what else we have in here. Uh, oh, there's a resistor pack that's probably doing some pull-ups for the cartridge slot. I know when you plug in the cartridge, a couple of these is disabled. Notice they don't have a cartridge in them. There are games running in here, so there are games built into the console. I think that's something like uh, the Bali Astrocade, if I remember right, had some built-in games. Let's see what do we have over here. There's a, let's see, there's a 4515. That's a 4 to 16 line decoder that I know is part of this diode matrix in somewhere or another that's reading the uh, various keypads. And then there's a couple of logic chips here, 4042 and a 4001. Okay, so the data sheets say the 4001 is a quad input NOR gate and the 4042 is a quad clocked D-latch. I'm gonna guess this is part of the address line decoding. Okay, so I've plugged into a cartridge. Fortunately, they tend to have instructions on them because <laughs> without it, it would be hard to know how to start the game. Anyway, let's see. Horizontal intercept, press key A1 to program. That's an odd way to put it. Okay, let's press A1. Ah, okay, so there's a 
Oh, look, there's a spaceship going by. Let's see if... Oh, okay, pressing two launched my missile. But I can't actually steer it. And that leads me to the main remaining problem with this console, which is not all of these keys work. And it looks like the keypad on the right here just doesn't work at all. But maybe that's only because that only shows up in certain games and use this keypad more. Anyway, I need to get the keypads working all the way. Okay, so the keyboard input is interesting. We have EF3 and EF4. These are actually input lines on the 1802. The 1802 processor can not just read these and do something, but they can actually read the status of the EF4 and EF3, and as you might guess, there's also an EF1 and an EF2 inputs, and jump. And I think they could do that in one instruction. These can also be used for interrupts. Anyway, these are tied to, these are tied to plus five volts. They're tied high through 47K pull-up resistors. And digging into it a little bit more, we can see that essentially what this 4515 chip is, we've got four data lines tied to these ABCD inputs that select, I think, one of these outputs, basically. And the way this is set up, because if you think about it, uh, basically all of the keypad is tied to either that EF3 or that EF4 line, depending on which keypad it is. And it's tied high through that 47K pull-up resistor. So essentially, when you press a key, it either stays high, or if it's selected the correct output to be zero, it's pulled low. So most of these lines, most of the time, are probably high, and then depending on what the microprocessor program wants to see at that particular moment, it will pull one of these lines low, and it'll probably you know cycle through and scan those in order to see if something's being pressed. So conveniently over here, these are labeled. That C common connects to either EF3 or EF4, I can't remember. And then the other numbers are conveniently labeled. And by sticking some probes into here and checking for continuity, I, I was able to confirm that as you press different buttons, you get continuity uh, for 741309236.9, depending on what you have pressed. And that C there, that is indeed hooked to one of the, uh, that does have continuity to one of the input pins on the 1802 that are the two sort of pins down here. One of those is, that's RF3 and RF4 going that direction. Anyway, uh, so it seems like that's all working okay. The problem we do have is over here. If you ever do work on this board, these are not actually connected to anything, but this labels what these little squares are on the other side of the board. And that was a big help in figuring out what was going on. So the common there is this guy over here, and I was able to confirm there's continuity between here and the appropriate input, EF input over here. Um, but I don't seem to be getting, when I do the same trick, I don't seem to be getting continuity when I'm pressing the buttons. But if I actually take a wire and connect common to one of these, I can essentially force a button press. So that is working if if I connect it manually over here. So obviously the thing's not working. So I suspect that because it seems to be a problem with everything, that there's something about this common line here that's not hooked up correct over here. So I'm going to check that out next. Ah, so there's little tabs here. Let me pull those this way and then see if I can get the keypad to snap out. Okay, so here's the keypad. Hmm. Okay, let's dig in here. And oh boy, look at this. Well, one of my ideas was to uh, make these detachable anyway. <laughs> Woo! Let's see what the other one looks like. Okay, so this was the keypad that I think was working, but um. Okay, after a good amount of jiggery and pokery, it looks like just this ribbon cable here was not... Oh, those contacts aren't necessarily great looking. Anyway, it doesn't look like it's making good contact here. And by good contact, I mean was not making contact. 
at all. So, looks like everything's fine over here, but it might not be for much longer. And this might have been my fault in opening and closing this thing so much. I might have just put too much tension on this and, and pull it off the connection. Anyway, I'm going to try reseating this and see what happens. Okay, so the ears have not been kind to this ribbon cable. This is probably where a bend was, and of course this is where it makes contact. But I am getting continuity all the way from up here down to here. So I'm going to try reseating this. Okay, so now it looks like I have liftoff on controller B. All I did was try to carefully reset this ribbon cable in here. And uh, let's let's see what we can get. So I'm going to press 1. This should start our Doodle program. And with our Doodle program, I should be able to... There we go. So I'm moving the cursor around. I think if I press 5... No, I can. <laughs> Sorry about the lights up there. Ah, okay, so it wraps around the screen. I think, does this put in a race mode or? Oh, that looks like it's in a race mode. And I think there was some mode that went into crazy randomness. <laughs> okay, I was just pressing the five button there. Okay, let's try patterns. So I reset, pick number two. All right, it looks like they want me to make some sort of little sketch. And then if I press zero, it repeats that sketch. How very exciting. Okay, let's try bowling. Yeah. Okay, now we're gonna try the freeway game. And without the instructions, it'll be really hard to figure out what's actually going on here. Looks like you use the right, ah, hit the car. And then use the left in order to speed up and slow down. So I can't really use both of these while, uh, while holding the camera. Uh, there you go. Oh, what happens if I hit the edge? Oh, yeah, it just nothing happens if I hit the edge. Ah, enough of that. Okay, and the last built-in game is addition. Um. Okay, so I think I think it's a race game or something. And two plus three is five. Three, one, three, I guess. Okay, let's get, try getting it wrong. Okay. Oh, it's, that won't pass. Okay. Getting it wrong again. That should be... Wait, isn't two... Pl okay, that should be six. I, uh, I don't care. <laughs> okay, enough of that. So one of my original ideas was to make these separable controllers that you could actually hold in your hand, but something like that freeway game where you control the speed with um, the left control and the steering, the left and right with the right control. Huh. Maybe maybe the best idea would be to have dockable controllers where you can hold it in your hand, but then put them in some sort of dock to, to be able to use them both at the same time readily. Hey, some sort of a, maybe inspired by the Nintendo Switch. Or maybe not. Okay, so according to the instructions, horizontal intercept game, press A1 to program. Okay, we're programming. <laughs> A2 fires rockets. And 4 and 6, B4, B6, shoot. Excuse me, steer rockets. Okay, so I'm going to fire a rocket. Woo! <laughs> Oh, got that one. Wasn't that an amazing explosion effect? I guess, you know, this came out after the Fairchild Channel F, which had twice the resolution and color. And I 
think about three-fourths of a year later or something, the Atari 2600 came out. But, you know, if this had come out, say, a year earlier, say, in something like 1976, and it was the only thing out there besides, you know, various Pong consoles, we uh, missed of various sorts, you know, this this would have been this would have been groundbreaking. Uh, hey, I thought I got the... No. Oh, whatever. Okay, so let's try uh, vertical intercept. So press A3 to program. We have programmed. Okay. And then it says B2... No, A2 and B2 fire rockets. Um, can I steer them at... Oh, wait. Oh. You can fire the rocket, and if you press the fire button again, I guess it gives it a, a fuel boost or something. Uh, okay. <laughs> what are we supposed to do now? Reset it? Okay, let's see, uh... Ah, okay, so now I'm, I'm playing both sections at once, and again... Okay, here we have Tennis Squash. I'm actually surprised this isn't one of the built-in games, although maybe they're trying to differentiate themselves. Um, let's see. If I went Squash, press A1 to program. There's Squash. I uh, can choose the racket size using the B keyboard. Uh, I'm supposed to, I thought. I'm pressing... Oh, maybe maybe that doesn't happen for squash? I don't know. Anyway, let's see if I... Uh, key A7 to start. Ah, there we go. Is this actually works much better with a paddle rather than straight up and down controls. Okay, let's try uh, two-player tennis. So I hit two. Racket size, four, five, six. I'm not sure if that's changing anything. Huh. Ball speed and start game. Let's do A7 for slow because I'm playing against myself here. Wee. Nah. Anyway, you get the idea. Okay, and uh, here's Blackjack. Yeah. All right, so let's press one on keyboard A for a one-player game. Cut appears on the screen. Press zero key, key on either keyboard. Um... Bet each player bets from a dollar to ten dollars is key zero. Um, hit key one, double key two. Yeah, okay, whatever. Okay, so I do need to figure out how to get this thing back together. Uh, most of the consoles we have for this retrofuturistic hardware project are just kind of permanently in a state of not being screwed in because we get, need to get into them and mess around. Now, I think if I don't use the strain relief on this cable, I can fit it. And let's see if the circuit goes in here. All these things can go in here. This go in here. I, I think I can get all the various doodads out of here without needing to drill any more holes. I was tempted to just cut this cable all together since it's not going to be actually used for anything, but I, I do have a preference on most of these things. If I don't need to hack something that's this old and this original, then I try to avoid hacking something this old and this original. Although, of course, I specifically bought this to hack. These are not super rare. And I didn't pay too much for this on eBay. Part of it, I think, is if, if you find one original in a box, of course, it's more. And if you find one with all of the accessories, like the the Switch box, 
that combines the DC input and the video composite, not composite, the RF video output, you know, that's fairly rare now. So the, the idea is that we would try hot riding this in some way. Uh, one could potentially add the, I think it's the 16, no, or the 1862 chip that adds color to this. Not very fancy color. We could add more memory. We could do all sorts of things. Probably at that point, it would probably make more sense to actually just make a new custom board. Uh, you know, we could we don't really need this many chips nowadays. I don't know. We could try hot rodding this in various ways. I think the Cosmac VIP, which is one of many computers based on this 1802 of a hobbyist sort, had the Viper was the newsletter for that Cosmac VIP. And they actually have instructions on building a, like basically a Romulator kind of thing to encourage people to write their own programs for it. Who knows? Okay, I did something really dumb, which is, I for some reason thought it was a good idea to loop these little ground wires through these little holes here to give them something to anchor on. But of course, that's <laughs> those holes are there for a reason. Um, huh, okay, yeah, can't believe I thought that was a good idea. Anyway, yeah, that's supposed to, this hole here matches with that hole there where the screw goes, and of course that would mess it up. So, uh, let me, let me fix that. Okay, so I moved the ground wire for the video buffer over here. Connect that, still doesn't look great, but whatever. And I moved the main ground wire for the whole system, you know, power input ground up to here. Again, looks grotesque, but uh, we'll see how it works. And it looks like it still works after fixing the, or uh, after moving the ground connections for whatever that's worth. <laughs> 